Well, it's 14 months now since election night 1990. 1990, the year the voters of Oregon finally passed a property tax limitation measure and the margin of passage for Measure 5 came from the Tri-County metropolitan area. It's our baby. In 1990, with her margin of victory coming from the same three counties, Barbara Roberts was elected governor. Yes, the same voters who made Governor Roberts governor perversely handed her a challenge <laughs> by which her administration is sure to be measured. How do you deal with revenue shortfalls of a billion dollars? Some Oregonians still complain that the governor is fixated on a sales tax and that her conversation with Oregonians has just been a diversion. Well, I'd like to suggest that notion is just plain blockheaded. If you were here in 1969, you remember that Governor Tom McCall, at the height of his popularity and with the backing from the legislature, pushed a ballot measure titled Property Tax Relief and Sales Tax. And you'll also remember that it went down by an 89 to 11 percent margin. <laughs> with full knowledge of Oregon history, Governor Roberts has taken the unprecedented and very Oregonian approach of talking in depth, face to face, with as many people as possible to find out more about what they really want. Last evening in her State of the State address, the governor emphasized that she has indeed been listening. I think it's fair to say that today, no one in the state has a better sense of what Oregonians of all stripes think than does our governor. Last night, Governor Roberts announced governmental downsizing and streamlining as a demonstration of good faith to the voters. Can the vicious grip of public cynicism on state and local governments be broken at last? The governor last night did not mention a special legislative session in her address. Does that mean no new tax programs this year? Today, in her first appearance as governor before Portland City Club, Barbara Roberts reports on and continues with her conversation with Oregonians. Throughout her public career, Governor Roberts has personified the traits of citizen activism and involvement that are the hallmark of Oregon politics and of the City Club of Portland. So please join me in welcoming to City Club our Governor, Barbara Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that nice welcome and uh, making me feel so at home when I come back to Portland. Well, I hope it's safe to assume that a large percentage of you either heard last night's State of the State address or read the accounts in the morning paper because I'm not going to recite it again to you. There are a lot of people in this room who have known me a very long time, and I think for those who have known me for years and for those of you who know where I'm coming from, for some people last night's speech was a surprise. And for those of you in this room who are still in denial about what is happening to Oregon, who can't see the train that's coming at us, you may have thought that my actions were too harsh and too early. Well, I'd like to respond for just a minute to both of those reactions. First, I want to assure you that I have not lost my vision for Oregon. I hope I made that clear last night as I cited the things I thought this state needed to be the kind of state we wanted it to be. And for those of you who are still in denial about the climate and the calamity that we face, I hope that last night's speech was a wake-up call. For there are few luxuries as governor when it comes to facing reality. Political and financial denial could leave this state crippled for decades. So let me focus today on Oregon's realities and on my realities. Now, if you want to talk about a real reality check, I think the conversation with Oregon qualifies. <laughs> I spent countless hours in 1991, as you well know, asking Oregonians what they thought about their government, asking them what they thought about the job that we do and about the services we deliver and the services they want and need. And out of that came some very, very clear messages. 
The one that I will tell you is really at the top of the list. I don't think Oregon is alone, but it is a clear mes message here as well, is that the citizens of this state have lost confidence in their political leaders. They don't trust us anymore. They don't think we hear. They just don't have any confidence left in their political leaders. It is very hard to lead if followers have no trust. We also found out more than clearly that Oregonians are frustrated and they are cranky. <laughs> no doubt about that one. They also think that we don't spend their tax dollars very well, that there's a lot of waste and duplication. They want more efficiency out of their governments. They want better delivered services. They don't want just the service there. They want it to be a good service when it arrives, serving the people it was intended to serve. But after all that frustration and that cranky behavior and all of the other things we heard about mistrust and confidence, there was another important message, and I think in the end it will be the message that saves Oregon, and that is that Oregonians do care about Oregon. They care about that vision and they care about that future, and that is critical to where we are going. But the bottom line is, for the thousands and thousands of Oregonians that I talk to, is they want to know that the tax dollars they send to us are being spent well, and they want to know that those tax dollars make a real difference in Oregon. That's a reality. My second reality is one that was just mentioned as I was introduced. It was the one that arrived on my shoulders about four minutes after I was elected. You know it, ballot measure five. It was the shortest honeymoon in political history, I think. <laughs> And one of the things about Ballot Measure 5 is I think there's a great deal of confusion around the state about what it is and what it does. And a lot of people said, I only meant to cut my property taxes. I didn't mean to damage state programs. A lot of people don't understand the relationship between that local property tax relief that they were seeking and the crisis we seem to be having as we face this issue in state government. The issue of the five-year transition year after year as those local property taxes that will eventually, believe me, come off your property tax. I know it's hard to believe, but it will. But as they transition off of that property tax at the local level and arrive on government shoulders at the state government level, we will feel, without any real relief for us, that change. In this current budget, it meant $550 million in the budget that related to that transition from local property tax to the state obligation. Now, we were fortunate, as you well know, in this current budget, while many of us predicted awful things would happen, we were relieved by the fact that the economy in this state is so good and so sound right now that it made up for part of what would have been a much more difficult loss right at $700 million instead of $550 million. So the cuts were relieved by that economic uh, uh, positive note. But in 1993-95, as you heard last night and as you will continue to hear, we are looking at an additional $1 billion cost for the shift from local property taxes to the state government's general fund. And by the time we reached 95-97 for the final biennium when Measure 5 transitions in, we'll be talking about at least $2.5 billion dollars two and a half billion dollars out of the state's general fund budget. Now, I tried to say clearly last night, I would like to say it again as clearly as I know how. One billion dollars is a lot of money, okay? I just want to be real clear about that. <laughs> it's one of my realities. Last night, I tried to lay out an example of the magnitude that one billion dollars means in state government. And I had to say it very clearly, this is not a proposal, this is only an example, this is not a proposal, this is only an example, because I didn't want it to be the headline this morning. <laughs> but we looked at the higher education budget and looked at its proportional share of that one billion dollars, which is about 138 million dollars. And what I said last night, and I'll repeat to you again for magnitude purposes, we could close Western Oregon State College, Eastern Oregon State College, Southern Oregon State College, and the Oregon Institute of Technology, and we would still be $40 million short of reaching higher education share. 
That's what magnitude means when you talk about $1 billion. Try to translate that not just into higher ed's arena, but into human resources and public safety and all of the things and other education levels that we care about and know are important to Oregon's future. So with those realities on my desk, on my shoulders, in my administration, we have had to think about how you begin to plan and respond to the reality that we face. What kind of actions do you take? Where is the leadership that helps you face that kind of a change in Oregon? Well, the first thing I would tell you, there are no one-step solutions. There are no quick fixes. There are no easy answers. And for those who believe we can just take the lottery line out of the state budget and solve the problem, I'd like to tell you we can't do that. One of the re people asked me, gee, you went on Channel 2 and you did that show the other night and they really were mean to you on, on uh, Town Hall, and why would you have done that and let yourself be subject to that? And I said, because I got to put my charts on television. And <laughs> my security blanket are those charts that I've been carrying around and sharing with Oregonians because one of the things they show when you look at the state budget and see where the money comes from, that the lottery is a little teeny bitty line and it helps people to understand it is not the solution to our problems. One of the steps, one of the actions that we will take and I will continue to move on is what's called state agency restructuring and consolidation. I described one of those first steps last night, which was to take the Department of General Services and the Department, Executive Branch Department and to unite them, to consolidate them. By doing that, we cannot only do government more effectively in terms of those services, but we can save about a million dollars just in making sure that we have one central support agency that serves the agencies of state government. A million dollars is not a billion dollars, but every one of those add up to part of the solution to the problem. One of the other things I talked about last night was about the issue of boards and commissions. Now, some of you who've been around the City Club for some time will recall that I came to this body once at the request of the City Club to do a speech about the role of citizen participation in Oregon's government and in our climate. Part of that speech, though there were lots of other components, a major part of that speech talked about Oregon's boards and commissions and the contribution they make to the state, to the way we think, to our ability to bring new ideas together, to serve a voice for Oregonians in their government and a chance for government to hear their ideas and m hear that contribution and help shape policy. And that is all true today. That has not changed. But when you look at boards and commissions and recognize we have something around 300 of them now, when you recognize I'm supposed to fill all the vacancies on all those boards and commissions and make geographical apportionment, uh, you know, partisan apportionment, all the things that make those boards and commissions balanced, how do you deal with 300 boards and commissions? And is a board or commission that's formed in 1952 still valid in 1992? Well, the legislature has formed 82 boards in the last 15 years since 1977. In 1977 was when the legislature decided and some of the public members decided it would be a good idea to start evaluating how many boards and commissions we had. So they formed the Sunset Review Committee. <laughs> In that time, they've added 82 more boards <laughs> and they cut two, the watchmakers and the auctioneers. Well, at that rate, you can see where we will be in another 10 years. I have already identified 29 boards, and for those of you who may be interested, the list is available as you leave today, that I will propose to eliminate. And I believe that we can eliminate and consolidate at least 50 more boards as I identify their roles over the next six months. That is the difference between saying it is an important element of Oregon's government and saying there is a point where it is out of hand and it is not possible to do the job effectively anymore. After listening to Oregonians and after a year as governor and really overseeing the government of your state, I've come to believe that we can give Oregonians better service for their dollar. Now, that's usually not what liberal Democrats say. 
I want to tell you we can do it better than we do it now. Government is going to work better, and as I said last night, we are going to work smarter, and we are going to work with fewer employees. Last night, as you know, I announced that we would eliminate 4,000 jobs from state government in this current budget period. Now, I want to say to you today, so you will be clear, that 1,000 to 1,200 of those jobs will be people being laid off from jobs that they currently hold. The remaining jobs will be cut through retirements and attrition and not filling current vacancies. And as those become vacant, most and many of them will not be refilled. That's 4,000 jobs, and it is not blue smoke and mirrors. This morning, our state managers received their targets of how many jobs they are expected to cut in each program in state government. I'd like to give you just two examples to give you a sense again of magnitude. In the human resources area, the target is 1,300 physicians. In public safety, it is 300 physicians. Public safety is state police officers and corrections. This is very real for state government. And believe me, this is very real for the people who work for state government, particularly as they wonder today if their job will be one of them. Now, as we've gone through this process of looking at our state government through new eyes and trying to see if we can find better ways to do what we do, I have created what was identified last night by me as the Lobbyist Full Employment Act. For every action that has been discussed, proposed or reported, accurately or inaccurately, the Lobbyist Full Employment Act has gone into play. I get the knocks on the door, I get the ugly telephone calls, I get the thousands of letters that we're trying to handle for everything that has been suggested. And one example I would share with you, I was in Medford about three or four weeks ago, and the Oregon Business Magazine was doing an interview with me and a, group, a small group of Medford business leaders. And so in the process of these question and answers that were being thrown at me, the questions from them, the answers supposedly from me, for these business leaders in Medford, they were cheering about the work to make government more efficient and to downsize some of what we do and to cut back in some places, and they thought it was wonderful, but one of the people said, this is all well and good except for the CPA board. <laughs> It's that but that makes this job difficult. There are people in this room who say she's doing the right thing. She knows that government has to be done better and more efficiently and more effectively. But don't touch the Arts Commission, the Oregon Historical Society, the CPA board, and it goes on, you know, the architects, whatever it is that's been discussed. It's a but. Well, I said last night, we can't get where we're going if every single board, commission, agency, department, or division is a sacred cow. We can't get there. And I have to be willing to stand back from the butts. <laughs> and truly evaluate each of the things we do in state government through new eyes. But if you looked at the things, just the things that I announced last night and looked at the expected savings, let me tell you what one of those announcements will result in if you add dollar signs to it. My action will save the state approximately $50 million in the workforce cuts alone, $50 million in this biennium over the next 17 months. And when those same job cuts are translated into the next budget period in 93-95, they will amount to something around $200 million. So as we begin to translate some of the things we can do now into the next biennium, we will be further down the road to dealing with a potential cliff that we face. However, and I'm gonna say this again because I think some people missed it last night, all of the efficiency measures all of the consolidations, all of the boards and commission changes, and all of the 4,000 fewer jobs will not be enough 
to meet the problem of $1 billion in the next biennium. Let me say it again, a billion dollars is a lot of money. Last night, I said that I would show the people of the state that we in state government are not afraid to change. I said that state government was going to show that we could do a better job and that we were going to show that we could do that better job before we started talking about restructuring Oregon's tax system. I made it clear, I hope, that I did not have a hidden agenda. I still believe that we should restructure Oregon's tax system. But clearly, let me say again, first things first. We can't do any of this one-step solutions. Last night, I told Oregonians that as their governor, I would earn their trust. Well, today, I am challenging you as civic leaders, as local government leaders, as school board members, as business leaders, to accept your part of the responsibility for restoring the people's confidence in every level of government. Our future depends on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. For our first question, board member and board host, Isaac regan -Strife. Governor, you have uh, just announced significant initiatives to consolidate state government and uh, to lead to state government efficiency in an effort to help rebuild confidence. During your conversation uh, with Oregonians last fall, I'm wondering if you heard the same level of concern about local government that you heard about state government. And if the answer to that question is yes, uh, what role do you see for the local government leaders that you uh, mentioned in the end of your speech to help you rebuild confidence in government? Thank you, Isaac. The confidence issue, the lack of trust issue, the sense that government doesn't spend tax dollars very well and very effectively is not just focused on state government. That's the part I'm focused on because it's the part I'm most responsible for. But I have to tell you during the conversation we heard just as many complaints about local governments, about school districts, about community colleges, and waste and things that weren't working right and inaccessibility and lack of trust and inaccurate statements that the local governments had made and threats that local governments had made. We heard it there just like we heard it about state government. The one difference I would tell you is that people do understand more in most areas of the state. I'm not sure that's true here. In most areas of the state about what local governments do and schools do than they do about what state government does. They're not sure what we do. They're pretty sure what local government does, but they're just as sure they don't think it's being done very effectively. One of the difficulties with, a, with a, an attempt to finally communicate with our citizens in the state and rebuild that, that link of confidence, that foundation we have to have to move forward, one of the things I think that is remarkable about it is if somebody does something stupid and that's the word, in some local government, any place in this state, if a state police officer, if a local police officer, or if a county commissioner, or if a city council person or a mayor makes a statement or takes an action that hurts government's image, if a judge makes a mistake, if somebody in Florida messes up, if Congress does something we don't like, the credibility issue spreads to all of us. This is a very broad brush. So I must tell you, as I attempt to do what we're trying to do in state government, it's not going to get us where we need to be in terms of the attitudes of the public about what we do in government unless it occurs at every single government in this state. I mean every single government. We need to think before we act. We need to think before we spend. We need to evaluate where we are moving before we announce public things and then get killed with them and the credibility problem is increased again. I think this responsibility is on every shoulder of every elected official at every level of government in the state and the metropolitan area because of the publicity you get about what you do in this area in a statewide newspaper 
really needs to look at itself with very, very new eyes. City Club member. Um, it, it appears to me it's a critical objective of your administration to help the Oregon economy move away from natural resource extraction and processing and more towards high value added uh, manufacturing and service types of industries. Um, given the, the really critical importance of this objective uh, to your administration, could you describe the system that you've developed to identify the state functions that are critical to getting you there, things such as higher education, things such as sort of economic development functions. Um, and could you please describe how your cost cutting and budgeting plans are going to be consistent with the system which is going to identify those state functions that need to be emphasized while others I think you're going to need to shift away from? Well, let me be very clear and very honest with you. We know now, through a lot of work that's been done in the last three or four years, where state government can do things that impact our economy now and in the future very positively. There's a lot of places we're doing that very well in state government, including higher education. But it also includes the kind of workforce we have, and that's local education in many cases. So as we have looked at all of those things that touch our future economy in terms of developing new markets and new products and new ways to do things in Oregon, in, in recruiting good, solid industries into the state that bring new good jobs into the state, all very important, critical in fact. But I've got to tell you, even knowing that, we cannot cut a billion dollars out of the 93-95 budget and hold those areas harmless. We can't do it because higher education is too big a piece of the puzzle and local education is too big a part of it. And human resources that helps us retrain people and do many of the things, our employment division, many of the features there that are very economically oriented, the economic development department itself, they cannot be held harmless because what that leaves is all of the rest of that burden on the shoulders of remaining human resources programs, natural resources programs, and other parts of state government. So that's the reason that each time tell, someone tells me, cut something, but don't cut the things that have to do with the economy, and don't cut education, and don't cut human resources, and don't cut corrections, and don't cut state police. We can't do it that way. So no matter how much we know about what those cuts mean in terms of long-term loss to the state, we have to balance our budget on the money we have. We don't have any other choice. And that's why the discussions we will have over these next months to bring that reality clearly into focus in the state are going to be absolutely critical. Paul Millie, a City Club member. Uh, let me preface my question by saying that um, I have had occasion to work with the state government in a consulting capacity and have found the people that I've worked with to be hardworking, dedicated public servants, and I've been consistently impressed with their abilities. But having said that, <laughs> um, in the process of cutting 4,000 positions and 1,000 to 1,200 actual people, how will you seek to restructure the civil service rules and union agreements that while they, on the one hand, protect state uh, workers from arbitrary, politically motivated hiring and firing, but also tend to, in uh, ca some cases, uh, and we can argue how much that is, tend to entrench incompetence and preserve longevity at the, at the uh, expense of ability. You know, it's an interesting thing, that entrenchment issue that people mention. I used to hear that when I was on the school board, that you couldn't fire a teacher because there was tenure laws in the state. And one of the things I believe very strongly is if there is a protection system that exists, and I believe it should in government and in school, school districts, and you've got an incompetent employee and you can't fire them, it's because you have incompetent management. <laughs> Every civil service law I know of allows good management and good administration to evaluate the people who work for them and when they are failing to meet a standard of competence there is room for action but i think the thing that will be hard about this is that 
part of the changes we'll make will not, well, let me rephrase it, what will be somewhat different about this and the, and the rules that you just mentioned in terms of civil servants is that about half of the people who will be looked at in, who will be taking these cuts, those positions will come out of administrative level uh, decisions where there is a different kind of civil servant uh, uh, setting. And so we will have a little bit more flexibility as we deal with about half of those 4,000 positions coming out of management positions. Oh, I can't see your Walt. Walt Roberts, City Club member. Government, <clears throat> Governor Roberts, I uh, would like to take our focus now to a longer term sort of what's happened over history and what brings us here today. And I <clears throat> want to ask you a question about the process that you've gone through with uh, conversations with Oregonians. And I'd like to ask you a question about Oregon Shines and Oregon Benchmarks and how we've forged a vision for the future. And um, so uh, in the longer term view of things, we're really grappling with some sort of hidden undercurrent systemic problems that are now kind of rearing their ugly heads. And I, my question is, is what What's, what do you see about the uh, processes that we have in place, uh, the benchmarks, the uh, conversations with uh, Oregonians? Uh, do you see uh, that that was valuable? And do you see other implementable processes to involve everyone in the process of determining a vision for the future and then getting after it? Absolutely, and let me see if I can elaborate on a couple of things. One of the things you touched on was the benchmarks, and what that brought to mind as I was listening to you was that we in Oregon have made some very smart decisions in the last 15 to 20 years. We have done some long-range thinking that many other states, believe me, have not done, and we can tell by the number of requests we get for the things we do well, land use being one of those, the benchmarks to set goals for the next 20 years in Oregon about where we're going to be on anything you can name in Oregon. That kind of long-range thinking, the things we've done with our environment, the things we're doing now with workforce council and housing and things that I believe are critical, uh, the health care issue. So Oregon has really stepped forward as a leader in this country in terms of long-range thinking and long-range planning and expectations. The benchmarks and the Oregon Shines document reflect that kind of thinking. I think that's why it's so painful for me and so frustrating to see this work we've done and this new economic diverse base we've begun to build in Oregon that has left us really economically stronger than most, probably almost any other state in the nation in terms of increased economic growth and diversity. At the exact time we're getting it right, Measure 5 arrives on our doorstep. And I think that's the thing that makes this so hard. We really have in place the tools for Oregon's future, and we know where we need to go. So the piece that's very clear is that we haven't communicated our successes. We haven't communicated our public view of public officials looking at it and some selective citizens looking at that view. We haven't translated that vision to Oregon. And the only way we will do that the only way we will do that is to bring Oregonians at every part of the state, at every level of work they do, at every positive, negative uh, attitude they may have, and to bring them into the process and help them understand what that vision means for the state. If we don't do that, we lose that vision. And the conversation was the first in what I hope are going to be a lot of steps in this state to bring the citizens of this state together in the planning for the future. You can't bond people to a vision that they have no commitment to. If they don't know it, if they don't understand it, if they haven't participated in it, it's not theirs, it's ours. It may be most of the people in this room, but I don't think it's most Oregonians' vision about Oregon because we haven't had them participate with us in developing a vision for their state. Thane Tenson, member of the club. Governor, uh, I applaud your determination to restructure and streamline government. But uh, <laughs> I uh, was particularly interested in the comments you made last night in your State of the State message about a Department of Natural Resources. You talked vaguely about some logical divisions within that department and the determination that you had made to make some streamlining and restructuring in that area. Having participated in the Department of Fish and Wildlife's 
20-year plan very recently. I'm particularly interested in, in your more specific thoughts in that area and whether you've thought about uh, potentially raiding the Department of Fish and Wildlife's dedicated fees to, to help other distressed agencies. There's the but again. <laughs> Well, let me say clearly, as clearly as I can say at this point of the restructuring discussion, we believe that we can take the natural resources agencies of state government, which are 15 now, and bring them down to about half that size, seven or eight, and effectively consolidate programs. That doesn't mean you raid anybody's funds. It doesn't mean that you diminish the importance of any of those natural resources areas, but some of them have very common links. And some natural resources agencies have things in their agency that really much more appropriately belong in another agency. And one of the ones that's being discussed is if field burning is in agriculture, which is a natural resources agency in those 15, does that mean that it probably should be left there? Or maybe does field burning belong in the Department of Environmental Quality? So in addition to consolidations, we may have some things very misplaced within those natural resources agencies. We have had very strong support from a lot of natural resources people across the board to the fact that we're looking at consolidations that have very sensible solutions. But the other piece that we cannot lose in this, this is one of the places where boards and commissions in terms of policy setting are absolutely critical. So the boards and commissions linked to those natural resources agencies will help us develop policy and they will also help us develop the structure of the specificity of that moving 15 to 7 or 8. Governor Roberts, I'm Mark Anderson, member and chair of this club's Arts and Culture Standing Committee. And I have a question about the use of our artistic and cultural resources, which rival our natural ones in terms of how people see us and how we see ourselves. I'm sure many in the artistic and cultural communities will rise to the challenge you have issued to us and my question for you is, what is your vision of how the arts and cultural resources we have can help aid you in creating, maintaining, and articulating the vision you have, both in the short term and the long term, for Oregon, and more particularly, your view of the role of the various arts commissions which bring in and manage federal and other kinds of dollars and monies to this state to do that? Well, I think people who know me, and a lot of you in this room do, know that my support for arts and cultural activities in the state is very strong. I was a major leader on getting the dollar check off on the income tax so that Oregonians, any Oregonian, contributes uh, to the arts. I think that's the kind of thing that, that is so critical to who we are, that, that gives us something that nourishes our spirit and, and our pocketbook at the same time. I think that's critical. The 1% arts program in the state has done a remarkable job of exposing more and more people to a variety of arts. Arts festivals are occurring in every part of the state. Artists are coming to this state because it is such a wonderful place to live and create all kinds of artists, including performing artists. And now to see the, the new work in, in movies and, and, uh, and videos that is part of that uh, culture. I think it's critical to Oregon's future. One of the things we have some difficulty with, though, if you look at us on the national scale, Oregon doesn't match up as well in terms of personal and private contributions and corporate contributions into that arts and culture. So those pieces I think we need to work harder on. The question is, where is state government's role in relation to the individual commissions and cultural organizations that are now part of government structure? Now there is a great deal of difference between saying, I don't support the 1% arts, and that's not important to Oregon. That's a negative. The other thing is, what does it mean when you say that a cultural commission of some kind maybe could be done better in the private sector than in the public sector? That's the kind of thing we're trying to evaluate. Where is the direct role that government should play versus the supportive role that we should play in terms of the very strong statements we make at every opportunity about the importance of the arts and culture in the state? So I think what we're trying to do now and what the task forces did as they looked at these issues was to say, is this something government needs to do or is this something this state should commit itself to and do outside of government? And I think that's the question we have now about where is the best place to do that and how can we bring the most funds and commitment to performing arts, to visual arts, and to all the cultures and museums that are such an intricate and wonderful part of the state. And I think those are the questions that we'll be weighing and balancing over the next months, working with the people from that community. Good question. Thank you. Governor Roberts, I'm Ray Polani, a member of the City Club. 
you mentioned the magnitude of $1 billion uh, biennial shortfall. It happens that the Department of Transportation says that they are short $1 billion per year for the next 20 years for their highway programs. A lot of the shortage is due to the fact that they cannot finance uh, more efficient, less expensive alternatives. Uh, my question is, when will Oregon voters be allowed to revise the Constitution to provide for more transportation funding flexibility? Well, that may be a question more appropriate to the legislature. Are, there are those of us who have felt very strongly that the restrictions on on the way we handle, for instance, our gas taxes in the state of Oregon may not reflect the realities of the 1990s. And some of us felt that way in the 1980s, as you know, Ray. And one of the things that is very exciting to me that's happening right now in the Department of Transportation, I hate these bureaucratic words, but they're looking at multimodal uh, ways to move people and product in the state. And they're not just focused anymore on strips of concrete, important strips of concrete, but they're not the only alternative, as you have proven for years, uh, to the issue of moving people and products. So now what we have them doing is literally laying out plans for how we talk about transportation in its broadest sense in Oregon. They are clearly moving to understand the importance of alternative types of transportation in terms of the state. That's a very important step, one that I have encouraged from the moment I became governor, one I encouraged before I was governor, and one that I continue to push on. The next step for us will be when has the time come that we are ready, we or a member of the legislature or the Highway Commission to move forward with the introduction of another bill to go to the ballot to say let's find a better way to distribute funds for transportation. The question is timing, Ray. I think it's going to happen, and I think Oregonians are ready to look at that kind of a change. But the timing is critical because, again, it relates to taxation. And the confusing messages we could have if we had a series of things on the ballot dealing with taxation and the messages didn't come out clearly, we'd be in trouble on the issue. And I want it to pass when it goes to the ballot. Governor Roberts, Roberts my name is Margaret Eichmann. I'm a member of City Club. Um, listening to your speech last night and thinking of your task to win back the confidence of Oregonians, it seems to me that uh, one of the problems is the great expectations of our time and culture at a time when life is getting terrifically complex and expensive. And it seems to me that your examples of what really one billion dollars means in terms of services really help people understand what they might have to give up um, in the coming years. And I really think that people need to have their minds won back as well as their confidence in government. I think they need to understand what they get for their money. And I'm just curious if, if you have any plans to really um, go about the task of educating the people of Oregon so that they clearly know what choices they need to make is t in terms of lifestyle and services what they're willing to have and what they're willing to give up. One of the things we have failed miserably at in state government, and I touched on the edge of it a minute ago when I talk about the difference in the awareness people have about local government's role, schools' role, and state government's role, we have done a terrible job in state government of informing the citizens of the state what we do at all. They don't know what state government does for the most part. They just know we're not very good at it. And we do a lot of things that make people's lives better. We had someone tell us during the conversation, look, I just want you to cut state government. Doesn't matter to me. I don't use a single service of state government. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I don't use a single service of state government. I think that tells that we have failed in our communication to talk about the things we do that matter so much to this state. We have an education job in front of us in terms of that. And when you look at that in coupled with a, with a confidence issue and the trust issue, one of the things I hear all the time is, you're just mad at us because Major 5 passed and you're going to get even with us by cutting the things we care about. Have you heard this? You're just going to cut the things we like. Well, 
the, the famous charts I talked about and how important they were to get on television, one of the reasons we use those charts in the conversation, one of the reasons, this is the first speech I've given in four months, I haven't had my charts with me, <laughs> and I feel a little naked. <laughs> But one of the things we showed when we showed a pie chart of state government, you saw the large wedge in there for human resources, for kindergarten through the 12th grade, for community colleges, for higher education, and for public safety. And then there was a thing marked other. Well, there was no way you could make any major cuts in state government without touching those programs that nobody wants touched, human resources, public safety, and education. That's where the money is. And so we've got to do a better job of making people understand that when we make cuts they affect things they care about that they believe are unconscionable to cut now they looked in the pie chart and said where is the part of the chart that shows waste graft inefficiency <laughs> and i said it's in the same part of the chart that shows inflation and population growth now, you can't talk about Oregon's future without talking about what's happening to the population that's arriving in this state every day. So not only are we trying to meet a stable population's needs that they believe ought to happen, but we're trying to meet an increase and very increasingly uh, population in schools and housing and sewers and roads and all the things we must have to serve people. We are going to try to start doing a better job of making clarity out of what we know that we have not shared very well and to help people understand more and more about the decisions we make and how they affect things they care about. The other thing that has made this very hard, I mean, maybe there's two other things I would say to you. One was the tactics of fear. And I'll say this to you as bluntly as I can say it. When Matt Prophet and Bud Clark and Barbara Roberts tell the people of Oregon something is going to happen because of a, a, a cutback and then it doesn't happen, we have a credibility problem. We thought it was going to happen. We thought we were sharing honest information, and it didn't turn out that way. So part of the job right now is to take every step that we are going through, as I started to do last night, and saying, these are the choices I have before me. This is who gets impacted. This is what happens short term. This is what happens long term. And here are some alternatives. In some cases, there won't be a line that says, here are some alternatives. So I think the best I can do to begin to bring Oregonians into the same reality we all need to have to get there is to share as much information about the decision-making process I am going through and state government is going through and hopefully local government is going through as we can bring to their attention before they glaze over. And I think we have their attention in a new way right now and we've found new ways to communicate and while we have them listening, we better deliver something that counts. Governor, my name is Kent Snyder. I'm a City Club Kent. member. First, I think you are to be commended for the sincerity with which you've been approaching this whole subject, and uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with it. <laughs> my question really is, is in two areas. One is in the credibility thing you just spoke about, is that when Measure 5 passed, everybody, the leaders in the government came out and said there are going to be massive cuts. That didn't materialize. Uh, therefore, it still makes us wonder how reliable is the information that there's going to be a $1 billion cut in state government. And given the information and the things that you've been finding out in communication with citizens, I'd like to know your opinion now about Measure 5 and whether it should be repealed or reduced. <laughs> Tough question. Um, let me tell you, first of all, I said, um, well, it was on the ballot. I said all the time it was being discussed that I thought it was a very, very poor and damaging solution to the property tax question in Oregon, and I think that clearly is coming to pass. I just am convinced that, that we can't keep looking for Band-Aids to do restructuring of taxes. I mean, we keep saying, well, let's fill the hole created by Measure 5. Let's, maybe we could go back and repeal the last two years or maybe the last three years about I me. Mean, people are looking for all these little quick fixes on the tax structure. Even if we repeal ballot measure five today, we would have a tax problem. Our tax structure is out of whack. It is not modernized. It hasn't been changed basically for 70 years. It's losing its equity factor year after year. It's not balanced anymore. 
and I don't know why we would go back and fill a hole or deal with a quick fix solution when we could go to the ballot with something Oregonians had participated in designing that was a balanced, equitable, fair, stable, flexible tax system for the next 70 years. I'm going to take something to the ballot. That's what I want to take to the ballot. But again, first things first. Because they don't believe us, because we have a credibility problem, we're going to have to convince them what this means if we don't do it. I am not going to do this on a campaign of fear. I've said it from the beginning because they don't believe. But I don't think you can put the 1993-95 budget together in state government and keep a secret what it's going to mean to the state. And as those issues become more and more clear, I don't think I'm going to have to say it as much. I think Oregonians are going to understand it. And I think it will begin to build the problem up to a reality area, and then we'll have to find a solution that meets that reality. <clears throat> Governor Roberts, I'm Randall Kester, member of the club. Most of the boards and commissions that you mentioned, perhaps all of them, were created by legislation. To what extent can you eliminate or consolidate them without additional legislative authority? I can't. And that's why I said to legislators last night, uh, this is sort of we're all in this together, I lay out those things I can do now, and those include the 4,000 jobs and some administrative changes I can make, but the dependence we have on making real changes rests on the willingness of the legislature to get to the same place we are about the necessity and being willing to take the heat to do what has to be done. So I can't do it without them, and I hope to bring them there. Uh, and it may not be quick, but we will get there because we have to get there. Ted Kay, City Club member. Governor Roberts, do you expect more support for your changes in the legislature from Democrats or Republicans? <laughs> well, I told the Speaker of the House in a meeting uh, a few weeks ago that what I wanted out of these, uh, all of the things we were working on was uh, 60 votes in the House and 30 in the Senate. Um, <laughs> And if we could do that, whether it was tax reform or whether it was restructuring or consolidation or eliminations, if we could do that, literally, to build the kind, of, the kind of force that says this has to be done, we will do it right, then we wouldn't have people playing election games with the votes. And now what you've got is a lot of very fearful people, particularly in election year, that if the Democrats vote this way, the Republicans will get them, and if the Republicans vote this way, the Democrats will get them. Now, we may need to make it clear if they don't vote right, the public will get them. I don't know. <laughs> I hope that one of the things we can do over these next months is to understand that the solutions we're looking for in Oregon are literally not partisan. The state's future is not a partisan issue, and I'm hoping we can keep it out of that bailiwick. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. Roughly 20 years ago, when the Department of Human Resources was established, we were told that we were going to get greater efficiency, better working together among what had been separate agencies. How is it going to be different this time? Part of what happened, BJ, when they put all of those agencies into the Human Resources Department, or what, what they created were divisions that were the same as the old agencies. They left the same emotional barriers there. They left the same structural barriers there. In some places, they left the same physical walls there that said, now over here is employment, and over here is children's services, and back here is mental health, and we'll put walls between them, and we'll have different managers, and we'll have different personnel officers, and we'll have different structures. They were no different in some respects than the old agencies. They were just under one letterhead. Well, the letterhead is not the problem. The problem is that the divisions still exist. They exist physically, emotionally, culturally within those organizations, and we've got to find a way to bring those walls down. If I'm a family who needs help in Oregon and I go to the Human Resources Department of my state government, no matter where it is located, I shouldn't have to move from building to building, department to department. I should be able to walk in and find out what's available to serve me. I'm a family in need. If I'm a, a child in trouble in Oregon, the same thing should be true, or a senior citizen. 
So the barriers are physical, emotional, mental, financial, any way you want to name them. But we are going to bring down those barriers so we serve people and we don't get caught up in artificial barriers.